Tenor Shoes, Patrick F. McManus. Why don't you throw out some of these shoes, my wife shouted from inside the closet. Are you crazy, woman? I need all those shoes. My bowling shoes, my jogging shoes, my hiking shoes, my canoeing shoes, my sailing shoes, my black dress shoes, my brown dress shoes, my brown casual shoes, my black casual shoes, my white casual shoes, my moccasins, my hip boots, my waders, my canvas wading shoes, my hunting boots, my mountain climbing boots, my down booties, my camp shoes, my sandals, my stop, stop, she exclaimed. I give up. You can keep them. What I wish, though, is that somebody would invent a pair of shoes that could be used for everything. Well, as a matter of fact, somebody once did. I wore them every summer when I was a kid. The shoes inventor, I believe, was a Mr. Tenor. And that's at least what we called them, tenor shoes. Once a rich kid moved to our town and tried to tell us that the shoes we were wearing were not called tenor shoes at all, but tennis shoes. We'd never seen anyone as ignorant as that kid. He didn't even wear tenor shoes, so we wondered why he thought he knew so much about them. You trying to tell us that these shoes weren't invented by a Mr. Tenor? Rhett Sweeney said to the kid. How come everybody calls them tenor shoes then? Only illiterates call them tenor shoes. Naturally, that got us all riled up, and we started yelling at him and pushing him and trying to get him to fight one of us. Listen. Pee Wee Thompson said. We're all just as normal as you are, except for maybe Bertie. He's a little weird. No, no, the rich kid shouted. Illiterate means you don't know how to read and write. Well, as soon as we found out that he hadn't, that we hadn't been insulted, everybody cooled down and started patting the kid on the back and telling him he was right after all, and we hoped he wouldn't harbor any hard feelings against us because of a little misunderstanding. Just the same, Wretch said. I ain't never heard of anybody by the name of Tennis. I did once, I said. I think his son was one of them English poets, but I doubt either one of them knew anything about shoes. Tenor, sh tenor shoes were made of black canvas and had rubber soles and little round patches over the part that covered your ankle bones. They were ugly. Tenor designed them that way on purpose so girls wouldn't want to wear them. You got your pair of tenor shoes each spring about the time the snow began to recede from the lowlands. There was an interesting little ritual that went with the purchase of each year's tenor shoes. My mother would take me down to Hobbs Dry Goods Store where Mr. Hobbs himself waited on the shoe customers. Howdy, Mr. Hobbs would say. By golly, I bet you brought this young colt in to get him shod. Mr. Hobbs and my mother would cackle at monotonous length over this witticism. Interestingly enough, when I was very young and first heard of the little joke, I thought Hobbs had said to get him shot. My fright was such that I behaved myself for the better part of the day and wondered long afterwards in what manner my sentence had been commuted. Hobbs' arsenal of wit seemed to consist of the single joke. And as soon as he had spent that round on his customers, he seemed to revert immediately into his natural self, perhaps best described as peevish. Sit down and take off your shoes, he would order. The shoes he referred to were generally some kind of clodhopper boots well along in the first stage of oblivion, heels and tongue missing, soles flopping loose, seams gaping, the laces of a Chinese puzzle of knots and frayed ends. As I peeled off the boots, Mr. Hobbs and my mother would both leap back and gasp. I thought I told you to wash your feet, my mother would screech, more for Hobbs than, than for me. I've never seen the likes of it. Mr. Hobbs would mutter under his breath about having seen the likes of it, something about hygiene films and Navy boot camp. How's that, my mother would say. Nothing, Mr. Hobbs would snort, nothing. He would then lock one of my feet in a measuring device, all the while doing his impression of a person removing a long dead rat from a trap. The measurement taken, Hobbs would get up and return shortly with a box of tenor shoes, which he would drop in my lap and order me to try on. Even to this day I recall with ecstasy the pure sensual delight of slipping my feet into a brand new pair of tenor shoes. My old toes up in the forward part of wiggling around, 
checking out their new quarters, and ankles swelling boastfully under the protective cushions of the rubber patches at the fat, clean laces snug tight the embrace of canvas and rubber. After a winter of wearing the clodhopper boots, I felt like I was strapping on a pair of wings. I'd better go try them out. Stay in the store, Mr. Hobbard. Mr. Hobbs would shout. Don't take them out of the store. But it'd be too late. I would be out on the sidewalk, and the tenor shoes would be carrying me in free-soaring flight around the block. The test completed, I would break to a screeching stop and re-enter the store. Maybe just a half-size larger, I would tell Mr. Hobbs. Gosh, I don't know why anyone would let their dog run loose on the sidewalk. But I wash these tenor shoes off good as new in a mud puddle, and as soon as they dry, Dog, Mr. Hobbs would say, Dog, nothing doing. Those are your size. That'll be 98 cents, Mrs. 98 cents, my mother would say. My lad, I don't know what folks are going to do if prices keep going up the way they are. Terrible, Mr. Hobbs would mutter. Don't know these young whelps are worth it anyways. He's always sound as if he meant it, too. To my mind, the tenor was the ultimate shoe. You could use it for running and hiking and jumping, for playing football and basketball, hunting and fishing, mountain climbing, rafting, spelunking, swimming, bicycling, horseback riding, cowback riding, pigback riding. Whatever the activity, the tenor shoe adapted itself to the task in a noble and admirable fashion. The one area in which the tenor shoe may have fallen a bit short was as a dress-up shoe. Suppose, for example, that you had to go to some social event where all the youngsters were dressed up in their best clothes. You showed up wearing your good pair of pants, your good shirt, your good socks, and your tenor shoes, which by now may have been showing the strain of hunting, fishing, backpack riding, etc. Now, as soon as you got within hearing distance of some of the other mothers at the affair, your mother would look down at your feet, conjure up an expression of absolute horror, and say, I thought I told you to wear your brown Oxfords. My land, you'll mortify me to death. Just look at those filthy old tenor shoes. Now, of course, all the other mothers would look at your mother and smile and shake their heads in an understanding way as if to say, What can you expect of little boys? What was truly shooed about this charade was your mother's use of the phrase, Your brown Oxfords. This not only implied that you had brown Oxford, Oxfords, but also black ones and possibly white ones. Maybe one of the reasons the ruse worked so well was that most of the other guys had protruding from the cuffs of their good jeans or good pants the unmistakable rubber noses of tenor shoes. If there was a poor kid present at one of these social functions, by the way, his mother would look down at his feet and say, Land sakes, Henry, didn't I tell you to wear shoes? Of course, all of us guys knew that Henry didn't have shoes. Otherwise, why would he paint his feet to look as if they were wearing tenors? It made you kind of sad when you thought about it. The great thing about tenors was their almost unlimited versatility. They were great for wearing inside a sleeping bag, for example. Nowadays, of course, there are little down booties especially designed for wearing inside of sleeping bags. The only problem with these booties is that they really aren't designed for outside wear, and if you have to get up in the night for any reason, they're not much good for wandering around over rough ground in the dark. Of course, when you're camping out as a kid, there's only one thing that can make you get up in the middle of the night, and that is the necessity of running for your life. And if ever there was a shoe designed for running for your life, it was the tenor. Many was the dark night that a troop of us young campers made our way home, trailing in our wake the distinct odor of smoldering tenors. Tenors made great fishing waders. Mr. Tenor, who must have been an absolute genius, had designed them without any insulation, so that when you waded out into an icy spring, it took only a few minutes for your feet to turn numb. From then on, you could fish in complete comfort. The numbness also prevented you from feeling any pain when your tenors slithered into narrow and odd-shaped openings between slippery rocks. You could continue fishing in blissful comfort, up above while down below the rocks committed various acts of depravity on your feet, rearranging the bones in imaginative waves, doing trick shuffles with your toes, and playing football with your ankles. We would often return from a fishing trip with the, an affliction known technically as cauliflower feet. 
Fortunately, we had the good sense never to remove our tenors until they had dried, thereby preserving our feet in, in the shape, if not exactly of feet, at least of tenors. Indeed, I was often afraid to remove my tenors after a fishing trip for fear of what I might find inside them. I have always had a weak stomach. There was considerable controversy among us about how often tenors should be taken off. The conservatives argued for once a week, the liberals for three or four times a summer, and the radicals for never, preferring to allow decay and disintegration to take their natural course. Although I was one of the conservatives, I shared the radicals' curiosity over whether, when their tenors finally self-destructed, there would be any feet left inside. I frequently shared space in small tents with tenor, tenor radicals, and the idea occurred to me more than once to take a caged canary in with me so that its sudden demise could warn me when the gas escaping from the radicals' tenors had reached a lethal level. To my knowledge, there was never any human fatalities from this cause, although large numbers of flying and crawling insects in the tent died mysteriously. There are many other theories concerning the proper use of the tenor shoe. These theories were passed on from older fellows to younger ones and were usually taken at face value. One of these theories was passed on to me by my cousin Buck, several years my senior, who had told me that little slits should be cut in the canvas of new tenor shoes so that in an emergency you can thrust some of your toes out through the slits and get better traction. This seemed to me to be a good idea even though I could never bring myself to cut a brand new pair of tenors. It was just as well. In fact, I'll never forget the day I saw this theory put to the test. Buck had taken me on a little hiking trip in the mountains for the purpose of instructing me in woodcraft. He was one of those people who loved to teach, but can never be bothered learning anything. What Buck taught me was any odd thought that happened to pop into his head, and some of the thoughts were pretty odd. He taught me, for example, that woodpeckers were tapping out code on the trunks of dead trees, warning other woodpeckers of their approach. He even let me in on the secret that he had cracked this code and knew, to, knew exactly what they were saying. Sometimes he said the woodpeckers even made jokes and codes, and Buck had to laugh when he heard them. What did that one say? I would ask Buck when he laughed. Oh, you're too little for me to repeat a joke like that to, he would say. But I can tell you this, them woodpeckers is pretty, pretty funny birds. It turned out that Buck's theory about slitting tenors to stick your toes out was on par with his knowledge of ornithology. ornithology. After what happened that day on the mountain, I never again had any use for Buck's teachings. What happened was this. We were walking along a single file with Buck, of course, in the lead, reciting all sorts of incredible nature lore to me. The weather was chilly and the earth and the mountain frozen hard, with patches of snow still lingering here and there. As we were making our way down the unexplored backside of the mountain, we came to a huge slab of rocks approximately 50 feet square and sliding down to a drop-off. The surface of the rock was smooth and covered with frost. But Buck started walking straight across the rock. I stopped. What you stop for, Buck asked, turning around about halfway across the slab. Tenor shoes don't slide on rock. The little suction cups on the soles, they grab right onto the... Buck was sliding. Well, this frost makes it a little slick, he said. I better... By now, Buck was really sliding. He gave up all efforts at further conversation and devoted full attention to scrambling up the rock. The problem was that no matter how fast and furious Buck's scramble was, his downward rate of slide seemed to be greater by about an inch per second. I had no idea how much of the drop awaited him at the brink of the slab. A hundred feet? Half a mile? I remembered all the mountain climbing movies I'd ever seen where a climber loses his grip and plummers, plummets downward until he's just a tiny noisy speck hurtling toward the patchwork farmlands below. From the look on his face, I knew Buck was remembering the same movies. Then I noticed that Buck had forgotten to stick his toes out through the slits in his tenors. Stick out your toes, Buck! I screamed at him. Stick out your toes! Buck's toes suddenly emerged from the slits like 
little pink landing gear. And I have to admit that he did some marvelous things with his toes. In fact, just about everything it is possible to do with toes and not get arrested. But nothing worked. Buck shot backward right off the edge of the cliff. His drop was accompanied by a long, horrible, slowly diminishing scream. I was a bit puzzled by the scream since Buck was standing there on the wide ledge just three feet down from the brink of the slab, his whole top half still in view of me. Later he tried to tell me he was just doing his imitation of Tarzan's ape call. Well, I'd heard him, I have, well, I'd heard his imitation of Tarzan's ape call numerous times and had never before made my hair stand on end. Buck was finished as my mentor. I was just as happy that I hadn't followed his advice and violated a perfectly good pair of tenors by cutting slits in them for an emergency. As with all good things, tenors did not last forever. Spring eased into summer and summer wore on and the tenors would begin to fade, the dark rich black of the canvas turning to pale dirty gray. Then the seams where the rubber was glued to the canvas would start to peel loose. The eyelets for the laces would begin popping out. The laces themselves would break and have to be knotted. Their ends would fray out into tiny pom-poms. The round rubber ankle patches would fall off. The canvas at the balls of the feet would wear through. Then a tear would move back along the instep. By September, the tenders would be done for. On the first day of school, your new clodhopper boots felt good. Their weight gave you a sense of security, of substance, of manhood and the will to face another year of school. But there'd be a note of sadness, too, because Henry the poor kid would be there, his feet painted to look like new boots. You tried not to think about it. My wife's muff muffled voice came from inside the closet. How about this pair of shoes? Can I at least give these to the Salvation Army? Those old tennis shoes? Sure, go ahead, I said. Heck, I never play tennis anyway.